Can you talk about the 1930s? Can you describe what happened in Holodomor, the Soviet terror famine in Ukraine in the 32 and 33? Yes. That so, killed millions of Ukrainians? Right. It's a long story, you know, but let, let, let me try to be as succinct as I can be. I mean, the Holodomor, the, the terror famine of uh, 32, 33, comes out of, in part, an all-union famine That, re that is the result of collectivization. You know, collectivization was a catastrophe. Uh, you know, the more or less of the so-called kulaks, the more or less richer farmers, I mean, they weren't really rich, right? Anybody with a tin roof and a cow was considered a kulak, you know, and other people who had nothing were also considered kulaks if they opposed collectivization. So these kulaks, we're talking millions of them, right? And Ukraine, it's worth recalling, and... I'm sure you know this was a you know heavily agricultural area, and Ukrainian peasants, um, you know, were on in the countryside and resisted uh, collectivization more than even the Russian peasants res resisted uh, collectivization. Um, suffered during this collectivization program, and they you know burned sometimes their own houses, they killed their own animals, um, they were shot, you know, sometimes on the spot. Um, tens of thousands and others were sent into exile. So there was a conflagration in the countryside. And the result of that conflagration in Ukraine was terrible famine. And again, there was famine all over the Soviet Union, but it was especially bad uh, in uh, Ukraine, in part because Ukrainian peasants resisted. Now, in 32-33, a couple of things happened. I mean, I've argued this in, in my writing and, and, and um, you know, I've also worked on this. I continue to work on it, by the way, with, with a museum in, in Kiev that's going to be about the Holodomor. They're, they're building the museum now and it's going to be a very impressive uh, set of exhibits and talk with historians all the time about it. So, so what happens in 32-33 is a couple of things. First of all, the uh, uh, Stalin develops an even stronger, I say even stronger because they already had an antipathy for the Ukrainians, an even stronger antipathy for the Ukrainians in general. First of all, they resist collectivization. Uh, second of all, he's not getting all the grain he wants out of them and which he needs. And so he sends in then uh, people to expropriate the grain and take the grain away from the peasants. These teams of people You know, some policemen, some urban thugs, some party people, some poor peasants, you know, take part too, go into the villages uh, and forcibly seize grain and, um, and animals from the Ukrainian peasantry. They're seizing it all over. I mean, let's remember again, this is all over the Soviet Union, in 32 uh, especially. Uh, then, uh, you know, in December of 1932, uh, January of 33, February of 33, Stalin has convinced the Ukrainian peasantry um, needs to be shown who's boss, that they're not turning over their grain, that they're resisting the expropriators, that they're hiding the grain, which they do sometimes, right? That they're basically not loyal to the Soviet Union, that they're acting like traitors, that they're ready, and he says this, you know, to, I think it's Kaganovich, he says it too, you know, they're ready to kind of pull out of the Soviet Union and join Poland. I mean, he thinks Poland is, you know, out to get, the U out to get Ukraine. And so he's going to then essentially break the back of these peasantry. And the way he breaks their back Uh, is by going through another expropriation program, which is not done in the rest of the Soviet Union. So he's taking away everything they have, everything they have. There are new laws introduced where they will actually punish people, including kids, with death if they steal any grain, you know, if they take anything from the, you know, from the fields. So, you know, you can shoot anybody, you know, who is looking for food. And then he introduces measures in Ukraine, which are not introduced into the rest of the Soviet Union. For example, the um, Ukrainian peasantry are not allowed to leave their villages anymore. 
they can't go to the city to try to find some things. I mean, we've got pictures of you know Ukrainian peasants dying on the sidewalks in Kharkiv and in Kiev and and places like that who've managed to get out of the village and get to the cities. But now they can't leave. They can't leave Ukraine to go to Belarus or Belarus today uh, or to Russia, you know, to get any food. There's no. He won't allow any relief to Ukraine. A number of people offer relief, including the Poles, but also the Vatican offers relief. He won't allow any relief to Ukraine. He won't admit that there's a famine in Ukraine. And instead, what happens is that Ukraine turns into, the Ukrainian countryside turns into what my now uh, past colleague who died several years ago, Robert Conquest, called a vast belson. And by that, you know, the images of bodies just lying everywhere, you know, people dead and uh, and dying, you know, of hunger, which is, by the way, I mean, I, I, as you know, I've spent a lot of time studying genocide. I don't think there's anything worse than dying of hunger from what I have read. I mean, you see terrible ways that people die, right? But dying of hunger is just such a, a horrible, horrible thing. And so, for example... Uh, we know there were many cases of cannibalism in the countryside because there wasn't anything to eat. People were eating their own kids, right? And Stalin knew about this. And again, you know, we started with this question a little bit earlier. He doesn't, he, he, there's not a sign of remorse, not a sign of pity, right? Not a sign of any kind of human emotion that normal people would have. What about the opposite of... Um joy for teaching them a lesson? I, I don't think there's joy. I'm not sure Stalin really understood Emotion what, what of, joy was. Any direction. You know, I, I, th I, I think he felt it was necessary to get those SOBs, right? That they deserved it. He says that several times. This is their own fault, right? This is their own fault. Um, and as their own fault, you know, they get what they deserve, basically. How much was the calculation? How much was it reason versus emotion? In, in, in terms of, uh, you said he was competent. Was there a long-term strategy or was this strategy based on emotion and anger? And No, I, well, I think actually the, the right answer is a little of both. I mean, usually the right answer in history is something like a that. Little, right now, you can't, you can't, it wasn't just, I mean, first of all, you know, the, the Soviets had it in for Ukraine and Ukrainian nationalism, which they really didn't like. And by the way, Russians still don't like it, right? Um, so they had it in for Ukrainian nationalism. They, they feared Ukrainian nationalism. As I said, you know, Stalin, Stalin writes, you know, we'll, we'll lose Ukraine, you know, if these guys win. You know, so there's a kind of long-term determination, as I said, you know, to kind of break the back of Ukrainian national uh, identity and Ukrainian nationalism as any kind of separatist force whatsoever. And so there's that ra rational calculation. At the same time, I think Stalin is annoyed and um, peeved and angry on one level with the Ukrainians for resisting collectivization and for being difficult and for not, you know, not conforming, uh, you know, to the way uh, he thinks uh, peasants should act in this situation. So you have both things. He's also very angry at the Ukrainian party and eventually purges it for not being able to control Ukraine and not be able to control the situation. You know, Ukraine is in theory the breadbasket, right, of Europe. Well, where, what, how come the breadbasket isn't turning over to me all this grain so I can sell it abroad and, and uh, you know, build new factories and support the workers in the cities? So there's a kind of annoyance, you know, when things fail, and this is absolutely typical of Stalin, when things fail, he blames it on other people and usually groups of people, right? Not individuals, but groups, again. So a little bit of both, I think, is the right answer.